Hello, hello, hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be. Welcome back to my channel, my loverlies. If you've never been here before, thank you so much for clicking on my video. I do so hope that you will like and subscribe before you leave. Become part of the Mall family. Mama's got your back, at least when makeup's concerned, and definitely when that makeup is cheap. We are going to use some absolutely fantastic affordable makeup today. Uh, and we're going to be doing this eye look right here. So, so beautiful, super simple, very wearable with a pop of color. I love this. You are going to love this. We're just going to have a good time. If this is your first video here, you picked a good one to, to come see me on because today is True Love Tuesday. And uh, this week's story is so good. I know that I'm going to have such a great time telling you guys this story. I really think you're going to enjoy listening to it. Uh, this week we're talking about Clark Gable and Carol Lombard. Guys, this story is so good, but fairly tragic as well. I don't really think that I've told a tragic love story uh, in a while, probably. So I think this is going to be really good. Uh, for this eye look, we're going to be using one of the new uh, Hard Candy Marquee palettes. This is in the uh, Future Visions variety. Ugh. Guys, these palettes are ridiculous. They're so good. They're better than the uh, the big elf palettes. I, I, I truly think so. Plus, you get a roll, row of glitters in here. And you guys know how much I love pressed glitter. I really do enjoy good pressed glitter. And these ones look absolutely beautiful. There is no glitter glue on my eye. There is no adhesive. They are just stuck to my eye. They're such great quality. I never really... Uh, I haven't cleaned up my face at all. I don't have any fallout from the glitter. They're fantastic. I highly, highly, highly recommend these palettes. If you guys haven't checked these out, definitely do so. I think these, this quality in the bigger pans is much better than the quality in the smaller pans. So just go for it. So, so yummy. Uh, we're also going to be using a couple of the uh, eyeliner stickers from Sheen Beauty. These ones are the pink ones. Guys, I love these things so, so much, especially when I want a lash line that's really poppy and bright and vibrant, but like precise. These are so much easier to use than sitting there and trying to get like a perfect eyeliner moment. Though it's very, very doable, I think these are just, they're perfect, especially for applications like this, where you're doing a super neutral, kind of nothing really going on eye, and you really just want your lash line to pop. I think it's so, so great. If you guys are interested in the story and the eye look, please stick around. We're going to we're gonna jump into it right now. You guys know, as always, I don't want to lie to you. So I do indeed have my little uh, notes sitting right here. So if I'm looking over in this direction, it is because I am looking at my notes. And I would like, to, I'm trying to give you the uh, most accurate story that I possibly can. So again, this week we're talking about Carol Lombard. Yeah, Carol Lombard and Clark Gable. Everything that I use in today's video is going to be in the description box below, uh, along with the links to all of my other social medias. Uh, as always, I will post a finished picture as soon as I get done with this look. I know sometimes it's easier to look at a picture. You can really zoom in and see what's going on. So if you guys want to go check out the finished pictures, please make sure to click the links below. And if you're interested in any of the products I use today, they'll be in the description box as well. Uh, I probably am not going to stop and talk too awful much about what I'm doing or what I'm using. But if you guys are curious, you can always shoot me a comment or a message and I will definitely get back to you. So Clark Gable and Carol Lombard. So they met for the first time in 1932. Uh, they met on a movie set. They met on the set of No No Man of Her Own. Now, I don't know too awful much about uh, Carol Lombard. Just because I, I really... She doesn't, doesn't really stand out to me as one of my favorites. So after this video, I'm definitely going to have to look into her and see what she's all about. Uh, I haven't seen No Man of Her Own. I've never seen that video. Vid that video. I've never seen that movie. <laughs> I was trying to say movie and video at the same time. I've never seen that movie, uh, so there's not too much I can say about Carol Lombard. I don't really have an opinion on her one way or the other, but I do know Clark Gable, and he's just the, uh, you know, <sighs> tall, dark, and handsome, brooding eyes, big, thick eyebrows, just... Very, very manly, but suave and debonair at the same time. Just kind of oozed uh, classy charisma. Just really pleasant to look at as well. So there's Clark 
Clark Gable. He was in Gone with the Wind. He was in a bunch of movies. Gone with the Wind being the one that pops into my brain first. So uh, they met in 1932. Uh, Clark at this time was 31 years old and he's married. Uh, he was married to a socialite by the name of Moira Langham. Carol was uh, 20, 24. Uh, she was in an unhappy marriage at this uh, at this time. She was married to a fellow actor. Her husband's name was uh, William Powell, and he actually uh, is most famous for his role in The Thin Man. Uh, and again, that's not one of my absolute favorite movies. I have seen it. Not one of my favorites, though. Uh, so, I mean, if you're interested, definitely go check it out. I feel like old movies are always worth seeing. But that's where, where he was famous for. The role he was most famous for was the thin man and she's very unhappily married at this moment i didn't really uh check into her marriage with uh you know william too awful much uh but it, she definitely wasn't happy she definitely wanted out um uh and carol talks about her uh, her kind of relationship with clark uh, on their first movie and she said it was all business. Uh, if you have uh, seen that movie, I haven't. But it says, uh, she said in a quote, she said, we did all kinds of hot love scenes and I never once got a single tremble out of him. So everything was very platonic at this moment. And I don't know if he was still in love with his wife at this moment or if he, uh, it just, just sparks didn't really fly. Um, but they just, they kept it very, very professional. Uh, no, you know, no fooling around backstage, nothing like that. Get in, say your lines, get out. So, uh, though this is where they first met, this is definitely not where they fell in love. Uh, it certainly wasn't love at first sight for them. Uh, that would happen four years later. So four years later, uh, they reunited at a, uh, at like a, at a, at a gala. So there is a ball that was thrown in old Hollywood called the Mayfair ball. And it was thrown every year. It was like a, basically it was like the Met Gala or things like that. Just basically a who's who of Hollywood. Every showed up in their best, uh, you know, in their best dressed, just kind of like rubbing elbows, uh, really just kind of getting everybody together. Uh, and only the best of the best, the who's who of Hollywood was invited. Now, uh, that year, 1936, uh, uh, a director, and he is the one who would later direct, uh, Clark in Gone with the Wind. Uh, but he actually asked Carol if she would, uh, oversee the gala that year. Apparently Miss, uh, Miss, uh, Lombard was very, very well known for dro for throwing like the most extravagant, beautiful, like, like just insane get togethers, parties, shindigs uh, in Hollywood. So they did. They asked her to oversee the preparations and the planning of the Mayfair Ball that year. And she did. She accepted. Uh, and actually it, th at the ball is where she ran into Clark again. I keep wanting to say Cary Grant, but it's not him. She ran into Clark again. And uh, all like throughout the entire night, they were they were flirting and they were kind of like, you know, rubbing elbows uh, all, all night, on and off all night. Uh, they they kept like kind of like a magnet. They kept coming back to, to each other. And it's so crazy because she was actually there. Uh, she actually had brought a date. She had brought Cesar Romero. If you guys don't know who Cesar Romero is, definitely go check him out. Uh, but she had brought Cesar Romero and was not paying him any attention at all whatsoever. I wonder if he felt a little bit rejected. Um, but she, she ended up giving Clark 99% of her time and attention. And this all culminated at the end of the night when they shared a very beautiful kind of slow close dance together and y'all this is when this is when the fire ignited this is when the fire ignited uh that very night even though she uh brought a date uh she went home she they shared a ride home together now she didn't actually go home with him because she was uh, you know a classy lady and uh when they when the taxi dropped her off 
or not dropped her off, but dropped him off at his hotel room, he asked her if she wanted to come up to his room. And she looked at him and she said, who do you think you are, Clark Gable? <laughs> I thought it was so cute. You know, because he's at this point in time, he is regarded as one of the sexiest men in the world. Definitely one of the sexiest men in Hollywood. Like, one of the biggest stars of his time. Like, everybody wanted to be, you know, the men wanted to be him and the women wanted to be with him. That kind of thing. And she was like, who do you think you are? Uh, but after that night, they became inseparable. Actually, uh, in an interview or in a, a documentary done about them. Later, it was said, uh, it was revealed that after the night of the ball, the longest amount of time that they ever spent apart was six nights, six days. That was the longest they ever spent apart for their, you know, the entirety of their lives together, which I thought was so cool. They must have really, really been in love, you know? So, uh, uh, still married. Uh, Clark at this point was still married, but he was separated. And at this point, Carol had gotten her divorce. Like I said, she, she brought Cesar Romero as a date. So she's definitely like on the scene. She's dating. She's, she's, you know, checking out her options. But you know, if you have a shot at Clark Gable, you take your shot. You know what I mean? He was like the it guy of Hollywood at that moment. And the sparks flew and they ended up, they ended up getting together. Uh, so uh, again, he was separated. Uh, he was uh, still married, but separated from his wife. So there's no cheating going on at this point in time. Um, fast forward just a little bit later. Again, they never spent any time apart. Uh, the longest they were ever apart was six days. Uh, they kept their relationship secret. They kept it like under wraps until uh, Clark's uh, divorce was finalized. Uh, that was in 19... Yeah, that was in 1938 when Clark's divorce, sorry, brain fart for just a second, when his divorce was finalized uh, and they actually married very, very soon after that. And then in March 1918, uh, yeah, 1939, uh, Clark was filming. That's when he filmed Gone with the Wind. And this is like at the height of his popularity. Gone with the Wind is an absolute classic, one of my all time favorites, like all time favorites. I absolutely adore that movie. So 1938, Clark is filming A Gone with the Wind and they actually take a, him and Carol, they actually take a trip to Arizona. And something that I thought was fun to learn about them is that they were actually both super outdoorsy people. And it's not something I really would have expected from them because, you know, they were Hollywood, uh, it, they were the Hollywood it couple, right? And you would think that they would much prefer caviar and champagne to granola and peanuts hiking up the hiking up the trail, but they loved it. They loved. Uh, they actually loved it so so much that they eloped to Arizona, and for their kind of like honeymoon thing, uh, they spent it hiking and fishing. And uh, one of her favorite things to do was camping and uh, hiking. And he loved to hunt and fish and things like that. Anything that involved being in the outdoors, anything that involved being outside, they absolutely loved. It was kind of their thing. And then when they got back and uh, started building their home together, they built their home in Encino, uh, California, and they, they, they built their home on this 20 acre, uh, 20 acre farm. Basically they had cows and horses and chickens and all kinds of things. Uh, fun fact about me, horses are actually, uh, I love horses. I love horseback riding. It's one of my absolute favorite things in the world to do. Haven't done it in a while, but it was, I just, I love, love, love horses. I used to have a horse for a little while. So this isn't the story, but I used to have a horse for a little while. His name was Duke. He was 16 hands tall. He was this big chestnut stud. He was absolutely stunning and was just like, it's, it's my favorite thing in the world to do. Uh, I would, if I could, if I could afford one, I would have a horse right now. Dang it. I just love them so, so much. So I loved, and I know a lot of, uh, older Hollywood people uh, enjoyed having horses, especially like thoroughbreds and things like that. Uh, horses are so expensive, not only to maintain and purchase, but like to care for and things like that. Horses are a, like, they're a big, big deal. 
And I love that they have horses and cows and chickens and all of that good stuff. It's like a uh, very, uh, very homey kind of uh, couple, but on this big, grand kind of glamorous scale. Love it so much. Uh, so they built it on this 20 acre ranch in California. Horses, chickens, hor horses, cows, and chickens. Um, when they, when work took them apart, this I thought was super cute as well. So when work would take them apart and they would have to separate for work, they would actually send each other these super cute, like gag gifts. And I love that. Just, just a kind of, I, I've been thinking about you kind of thing. Uh, so they would send each other gag gifts. I'm not exactly sure what the gag gifts were, but this tradition, tra tradition was actually started uh, on the first movie that they filmed together. So at the end of uh, No Man of Her Own, she, at the rap party, she actually gifted Clark uh, a ham with his picture branded on it, which I thought was so freaking hilarious. Like, cause I guess he's just a big ham. I loved it. I thought it was clever. I thought it was, I thought it was super cute and adorable. Um, and because they would do this every time work would uh, take them apart, uh, and, or, or even, you know, even if they were just trying to be silly or fun, uh, she said that they would just be goofy ones strictly for laughs and their entire home was filled with all of these little goofy reminders of their love. And I think that's so absolutely adorable just to have, just to be able to like look over on the wall and see something and it bring back a memory and a smile. I think that's so smart and a really great way to keep love special and alive, you know, but their house was full of all the, all of these cute little knickknacks and where, where do I go after that? They, okay. So they had their fair share of problems as well. Now, Carol was no addiction. There was no dr addiction. There was no, um, alcoholism there was nothing nothing like that uh they actually were very well put together people but when a man is a man and his ego are something that like even on a, a like a a, a a a peasant kind of scale like me and my husband i gotta deal with that man's ego all the time i'm sure you guys know exactly what i'm talking about could you imagine the ego of like the sexiest man alive, like the, the biggest it boy of Hollywood. Could you imagine the ego on that man? Obviously that was a problem. Uh, Mr. Gable, uh, loved women, loved beautiful women and didn't, didn't hide that fact from Carol at all whatsoever. Uh, he basically didn't think that he needed to, I want to read this to you because it was kind of like a quote. Uh, he felt like he, he didn't need to, he had no self-control. That's the word I'm looking for. He didn't, he felt like he did not need to control his urges because he, he knew he was a catch. He knew that he was, again, like I said, he knew he was Clark Gable. He knew he was amazing. And what woman in her right mind is going to give up all that because he was, you know, he cheated. And I mean, he was right because she didn't leave him. She didn't leave him because of the infidelity. But while he was off being, you know, a turd, she was at home desperately, desperately trying to have a child. And unfortunately, uh, that never happened. She was infertile and she spent a lot of time and a lot of money going to different specialists, trying to get her situation figured out. And there was just nothing that they could do to help her. Uh, she unfortunately was never able to have a child. She struggled with serious infertility problems. Uh, I actually know exactly what that is like. Uh, I have been struggling with it for a very, very long time. If you guys are struggling with infertility, I hope that this is not tr triggering for you. Please know that you are seen, you are heard, baby. I feel for you. I am there with you. If you want to talk about it, let me know. Um, but she, she was never able to have a child and add on top of that, the fact that her husband liked to wander off, definitely not like a, a, a an ideal situation. So, uh, one of the most, one of his most famous affairs was with his 21 year old co-star, not sure what film they co-starred together in, uh, but he had an affair a pretty blatant affair actually with Lana Turner. 
now if you guys don't know who Lana Turner is you definitely should she was a little hottie she was a little hottie she was a little sex pot back in you know back in the day and she was very very much younger than him and kind of in her prime and then here comes this very suave debonair debonair charismatic man and she kind of just falls into bed with him can't blame her too awful much though she should have known better everybody knew that he was married uh but this is actually what led to her very untimely death because uh i want to get this right uh it was revealed 75 years after they were married uh what actually happened and what led up to the plane ride that ended her life uh and we're going to talk about it just a little bit uh just a little bit um, Carol was a very shrewd businesswoman. She was, she was good at what she did. She was good with money. She was good with, she was very charming. She was, she was very, I, I want to say calculated, but not calculated in a cold way. She was just very, she just kind of knew what to do. And during this time, the war is going on. Uh, and you know, uh, the, the world is, is, it's, it's kind of going to hell in a handbasket a little bit. Um, so she was, of course, doing her part uh, to help and aid in that in any way that she could. Uh, but she was actually headed off on a uh, on on a trip to help raise money for the war effort. And the night before she left, it was revealed uh, that they actually had an argument. They fought. So Clark and Carol fought the night before she left on uh, about his affairs and I, they people believe that this is the reason he didn't go with her because if not they both would have perished you know what i mean uh so they fought he stayed home she left but actually he sent his business manager his uh there's a word for him and i don't remember what it was uh but he sent his one of his oldest friends uh with her by the name of his name was otto and he sent him in Clark's place to like watch over her and take care of her. Um, uh, Cl yeah, it, it, and it hit, so his affair inadvertently caused her death. So this is what happened. Uh, so uh, she, she got on a plane, uh, she got, she took a plane trip in January of 1942. It would be her last. She was de determined to get her home to save her marriage she was so determined to get home to save her marriage because again she had she knew what you know they had fought before she left and she knew what he was doing while she was gone uh so she was determined to get home to try to save her marriage and uh she so she forewent a longer train ride so uh we're in january it's wintry weather uh, and she had the choice of taking a longer cross country train ride or getting excuse me, getting on a flight, uh, and getting home quicker. And in, in favor of the train, she took the flight. She took that last minute flight on a bumpy commercial airplane with an unpressurized cabin. So not great, not great. Uh, before her death, uh, Carol did her part, like I said, for the war effort she this trip uh, the purpose of her trip uh she was going home back uh back home uh to indianapolis indiana and she was trying to sell uh defense bonds uh and i'm not sure what a defense bond is but she was uh trying to sell defense bomb bonds uh in order to help with the war effort she was basically just trying to raise money and she was super super successful at this uh, over a week, she actually was able to raise over two million dollars uh, in support, you know, uh, to, you know, in support for the war. So she did a lot of good, uh, very phil phil philanthropic. I think that's how you say that word. Uh, but she did her part. She did her part for uh, the war and everything that she could. Uh, and the, what was, oh, she said she was going to sell defense bonds for what she called, this is her quote, the best damn land there is, talking about the United States. Uh, before leaving Hollywood, her and her mother, and this is a like foreshadowing kind of, kind of thing, because before she left, her and her mother actually went and saw a psychic. Now, I know psychics and stuff are really big out 
west <laughs> really big out west they're they're kind of like not existent here uh but i do hear a lot of people talking about they went and saw a psychic and stuff like that so they went and saw a psychic and the psychic actually gave her like bad news uh uh, her, her, her fortune, actually, what the lady said, what the fortune teller said, she said, keep out of planes in 1942. There is danger in them for you. So like right then and there. Right. And I don't know about y'all, but I'm kind of superstitious. And if somebody like, if somebody had said something like that to me, girl, you best believe I wouldn't have set foot. I wouldn't have set a foot, not a single toe on a plane that entire year. I'd have listened you know, hindsight's 2020, but y'all, I would have listened. I, I don't play with stuff like that. No, thank you. Uh, but, uh, on her last trip with her was her mother, like I said. So uh, on this trip with her, uh, to Indianapolis, she took her mother, she took her husband's like business. What, what, what was he? What was he? Uh, they press agent. Okay. So she took Clark's press agent. His name was Otto. He was a very, very long time friend of Clark's and he basically sent Otto in his place. Take care of her. Look after for me. Look after her for me. On the day they were supposed to return to California, both Otto and her mother tried to talk her out of getting onto this plane. They both told her, look, this is not a good idea. Let's just take the train. I know you want to get home, but there's like, they basically knew something bad was going to happen. They they begged her not to get on to the not to get onto this plane. Um, Otto had a Otto actually had had on top, on top of the fortune teller telling her to stay out of planes. Otto had had a premonition of a plane crash just days before and had made this known. He told them, guys, I had I, just, <laughs> flames everywhere. No, let's not do it. Right. Carol did not listen. Uh, so uh, talk, he, they both tried to talk her out of flying. He had the premonition. Uh, and the con and not only that, but it was, we're in, Jan and we're in January and it's wintry conditions. Not the best for flying anyway. On top of that, they're in some shoddy kind of sketchy plane. No, thank you. Don't do it. Uh, her mom kept thinking about what the psychic said. Otto kept thinking about his premonition and they're just like, no, this is not a good, good idea. Don't do this. And Carol just didn't listen. She actually ended. She was like, okay, you know what? Let's do this. Let's flip a coin. Honey child, my butt would have been on that train so freaking fast. <laughs> she was like, no, let's flip a coin. So that's what they do. They flip a coin. And instead of, uh, instead of just doing what I think would be probably the smarter thing to do and just not getting on the plane. They flipped a coin and Carol won and all three of them boarded the TWA flight number three. Uh, yeah, was it TWA flight number three? Well, yep, TWA flight number three. Uh, she was so desperate to get back to Clark and you know, and I can understand this. I really, really can because her, she left Clark in after they had just got done fighting and arguing and you know she's worried that she's not gonna have a husband when she gets home or that he's gonna go out and do something absolutely stupid so she's desperate to get home to him desperate to kind of get home and make sure that her life basic, basically wasn't falling apart. And I understand it. I probably would have felt very much the same way. So she's like, no, I'm not waiting for the train. I'm not gonna take this train. It's gonna take me days to get home. I'm not doing it. We're gonna get on the train. So they got on the train. No, they got on the plane. They got on the plane. And this was the last thing she ever did. So after they got on the plane and they had made it pretty, pretty close to home. Uh, they made it all the way to Las Vegas, Nevada, and the plane had to stop to refuel. They refueled. Everything was fine. And then soon after they stopped to refuel, 
uh, the plane ran into turbulence and it crashed. Uh, it crashed uh, in Potos uh, it crashed onto Potosi Mountain in Nevada and both Carol, Otto, and her mother, they all died. They died on impact and it's heartbreaking. It is was a true, true tragedy. Uh, Clark was broken. You know, and at this point, you know, like I said, hindsight is twenty twenty. He you never you never know how good things are until they're gone. And he gets the call. He was actually uh, what did it say? Uh, he was he was so proud of her because he had spoken to her before he got she had gotten onto the plane. Uh, they had you know everything, everything, everything was everything all, was all right. Maybe he hadn't spoken to her, but I think he had spoken to Otto, and Otto had let him know what was going on, uh, and he had found out that she had raised over two million dollars. So we were super super proud of her. He was excited. Her mission had been accomplished. So he was actually going to surprise her and meet her at the airport to pick her up. And as he's getting ready to, you know, go and and pick up his wife cuz she's going to be here soon, he finds out that the plane crashed and he is completely and total, totally broken. Uh the first thing he does is he packs his bags and he uh he he lets Otto's wife know. Fortunately, Otto left Otto was married and uh, she was now a, a, a widow. Uh, so he got Otto's wife and they booked it. They, they booked a flight and they uh, showed up it they sh showed up in Nevada. And as soon as he got there, he demanded uh, he demanded he said I want to see I want I'm, I want I want to go to the wreck. I want to see my wife. And they told him that it was they told him that it was they, they couldn't do that uh, because it had crashed near they had crashed near the uh, top of the mountain and in order to get to the crash site uh, they would have to hike up this really really steep uh, really steep mountain there was lots of, lots of cactus and it was just really really difficult and even the the natives that lived there uh, and were the tour guides. Even they said, it's difficult for us. I don't think that you'll be able to do it. And he looked at them and he was like, I don't care. He was like, if you can do it, I can do it. It was like, you can either help me get there or you can just get out of my way because either way, I'm going. Honey, honey hot, wanted to go see his wife one last time and I don't freaking blame him. I would have done the same exact thing. So they go they help him they go they hike up this mountain and they hike until they start to see bits of the wreckage littered just all over the ground and they hike a little bit further and there they find all of all of the victims of the plane crash so it was it was uh, Carol her mother Otto and then on top of that there were 15 young men uh, pilots for yeah, the you know for, I'm not sure which branch, but they were pilots flying west, young pilots flying west to help, you know, to, to help with the war, to fight in the war, and everybody had perished. There were no survivors from the plane crash, and Search and Rescue was able to uh, recover one of her uh, hairpins, a hair clip that Mark had given her uh, the year before at Christmas, and it still had small pieces of her blonde hair stuck to it and he just he died I mean he died inside I think I think he truly truly loved Carol and when this happened I don't think he knew I don't think he knew how to come back from it I mean who would though honestly I know if something happened my husband god forbid i would be completely and utterly devastated i wouldn't know what to do with myself either absolutely no idea what to do with myself uh and they handed him the they handed him the hair clip and he just he howled with despair and but there's nothing there was nothing to be done there's nothing you could do i mean she was already gone so they went back to the They went back to the uh, hotel. They were staying at a hotel nearby. And 
he wouldn't, he, he just kind of died. I'm trying to talk and think and do this thing at the same time, but he, he couldn't, he couldn't function. He couldn't leave his room. The only thing he could do was pace on his balcony at the hotel. He wouldn't leave his room. And he was quoted as saying, I don't want to go home. I don't want to go home to that empty house. And remember guys, this house is full of memories. It's full of little trinkets from their gag gifts and things like that. So everywhere he looks, he's reminded There we go. Now it's on. Okay. So everywhere he looks, he's reminded of Carol and of their relationship. Every He doesn't want to go back. He said, and I quote, I don't want to go back to that empty house. If I had just gone with her, none of this would have happened. And I think that's the hardest part that he had to deal with. And I think it's the part that he couldn't ever get over was the fact that if he hadn't have done, if he hadn't have, do, have done those stupid things, and if he hadn't have if he wouldn't have cheated and if he wouldn't have argued with her and if he, if he would have just appreciated her instead of cheating on her, then she would still be there. If he had just gone with her, she wouldn't have been racing back, right? It wouldn't have mattered if, if the plane ride wouldn't even have been an option because it wouldn't have mattered when they got home because they were together. So that was something he had to deal with for the rest of his life was knowing that if he had just made different decisions if he had just done a couple things differently then you know that she would still be there and unfortunately that's you know like we don't always know exactly what to do we don't always know we don't always sadly we don't always make the right choices so he ended up he did eventually end up going back home he uh he did you know, he went back and he, he did he continue to live his life. Uh, but he was never, like I said, he was never the same again. And after Carol died, he never stopped loving her. He never stopped loving her. He never stopped. She never stopped being the most important thing in his life. And he never could quite get over. He never could, he never could get over her. So when he got, he went, when he got back to California, he started drinking really heavily. He started smoking heavily. He, I'm putting a little bit of glitter on now. I'm going to go in with this one. This is the pink one. Uh, he started drinking and smoking really, really heavily. Uh, he started riding, he bought a motorcycle and started riding his, uh, bike really recklessly and not really caring about what, basically whether uh, he lived or died. He just, he just stopped caring. He stopped caring about just about everything. And I think he wanted to die. I think he wanted to die and made that very, very apparent uh, a few months later uh, or maybe, yeah, a, few, a little while later. Uh, he kept, he, he kept Carol's bedroom untouched. Uh, he never would let anybody walk in there. He never let anybody move her things until he died. He kept her bedroom and all of her belongings in mint condition. Basically a shrine to her. 
he kept it untouched. Nobody was allowed to go in there. And then a little bit later, uh, he enlisted into the United States Army, uh, into the uh, Air Corps in 1942. And he told his friends before he left, he told his friends, he was like, I don't care if I come back. He said, I don't care if I come back. I don't care. Basically, I don't care if I live or die. I'm done. I'm done. And I'm going to go in the most honorable way that I know how. I'm going to go fight the war and I'm going to I'm going to die in the war. Uh, he actually ended up surviving the war uh, and he came back and lived pretty much, you know, a pretty uneventful life. Uh, he did, he never stopped loving her, though. Uh, when he died in 1960, he died at the age of 59 and he was buried. He made sure to be buried right beside Carol. Uh, they are both buried at the, what is the name of the cemetery? They are both buried at the Forest Lawn Cemetery in California. And I think it's heartbreaking. That is the end of our story. And I know it's a little bit anticlimactic, but I think it's tragic. You know, and, he, and you know what the thing about it is, is he probably would have, could because men don't know any better. I, I, I'm i not sticking up for him, but they just, I think sometimes they just don't know any better. Or they, I mean, they know better, they just can't help themselves. Um, but he probably would have spent, if she hadn't have died, he probably would have spent the rest of his life taking her for granted. He probably would have continued to be unfaithful and not thought a second thing about it. But instead, she died in that plane crash and he had to spend the rest of his life thinking about the fact that he treated the one woman in the world that he didn't, he didn't know he couldn't live without. He treated the one woman in the world with the least respect. And I feel like there's something to be learned from that because this whole, you know, you don't know what you have until it's gone kind of thing. When it's gone, it, I'm passionate at the moment. You see my, just flung out of my hand. I'm passionate at the moment. But when it's gone, it's too late. There's no fixing it. Once they're gone, you can't bring them back. You can't say, oh, I'm so sorry I did this to you. Oh, I'm so sorry I didn't love you the way that I should have, the way that I really wanted to. No, you need to love them. You need to trust them. You need to... You need to treat them that way right now. While they're here, while you can put your arms around them, while you can tell them you love them, you need to do that. And I think I live by that. I live by that. There, I say I love you to my husband and to my son two million times a day. I am not going to apologize for it either. There is no doubt in either of their brains that they are the two very most important people to me on the planet. There is nothing in the world that I wouldn't do for them. And if at any moment, if at any moment in time, God forbid, something were to ever happen, there is no doubt in my brain I would never have to live with the regret or I would never have to live with the fact that I didn't get to tell them I love you or they didn't know how I felt about them because by God they know it they know it they know it without a doubt in their heads hold your loved ones close hold your family close hold your babies even closer you never know what's going to happen you never know we're not, we're not guaranteed tomorrow and death doesn't discriminate you could be a highfalutin Hollywood actress you could be you know the girl next door death doesn't discriminate Make sure your loved ones know how important they are to you now so you don't have to regret not telling them later. Guys, that was our story for this week. What do we think? Did we like it? Did we love it? Was it sad? I think it was pretty sad, um, but enjoyable as well. And I think maybe there's something, like I said, uh, definitely a lesson to be learned there for sure. This is what the eyes ended up looking like. I think they're so, so pretty. That eyeliner, those eyeliner stickers look bomb they look so good they don't like look like stickers to me at all 
they're so so pretty it stayed on my eye beautifully i used just a little bit of that lash glue to really adhere just i only use it on the corners just to really make sure that the edges stick down really well but other than that these are going to stay on all day they're not going to go anywhere i don't have to worry about them super happy about that and i don't have to worry about them smudging or like bleeding all over my face because they're freaking stickers and at the end of the day all i have to do is you know peel them off i love the way that this look ended up like i said i will definitely be posting finished pictures over on instagram and facebook uh, i'm gonna finish my face and uh you guys can check those pictures out later uh what else I think that's about it for me today, but please know that I love you so, so much. Please let me know your thoughts below. Let me know, did you like this week's story? Uh, also, if you guys have any suggestions about who I should talk about next, definitely let me know those as well. Always down for suggestions. Suggestions are 100% appreciated. And as always, no filters, no edits, no fancy lighting. It's just me sitting in front of my camera, playing with some makeup, hoping you guys are enjoying what I'm doing. Babies, until next time, stay safe, take care of yourselves, and remember, you're important. Bye.